Hello, I'm Femi O'K okay, and you're in the stream. Today, climate change from a Caribbean perspective. We're going to look at how people in Trinidad and Tobago are dealing with the threat of global warming. Now, normally our digital producer, Malika Bilal, she's looking out for your live online feedback. Mm -hmm. But today I want you to be looking out for the fact that I am a, a weather geek, a huge weather geek, and just pull me back for the brink if I just get too excited Actually, about this I'm entire show. I'm looking forward show. to that part, yes. seeing the geek come out. Yeah, you might, you might change your mind <laughs> later. <laughs> You're not the only one, luckily. Our community here, I think they might describe themselves as geeks as well. And so right. what's interesting is that we're hearing from people all over the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and they're reflecting on what they have in common with Trinidad. So we've gotten tweets from Antigua, which I pulled up on my screen here. We've also gotten comments from Dominica and from Barbados. And of course, we want to hear from you at home. So join the conversation with hashtag AJStream. And you can also join the conversation through our Facebook page. So to find it, you just go to facebook.com slash AJStream and add your thoughts to our discussion thread. This is where you can actually comment on stories that we're following. Here's one that we're following in China and all of the other stories and pitch in your ideas. Check out what we've got on Instagram. So much to do and so little time to do it in. That's on our Facebook page. Check it out. Hi, I'm Mae Bufi. I'm the executive director and co-founder of 350.org. We're an international climate change campaign, and I'm in the stream. How do you explain a shortage of water in the Caribbean islands? Scientists say that the reasons are linked to climate change. Due to rising sea levels and changing weather patterns, many Caribbean nations, including Trinidad and Tobago, are facing threats to not only their clean water supplies, but also to their farmland, fishing and tourism industries. The region, which was already vulnerable to extreme weather, is facing the impact of climate change right up close. But is this translating into action? So today we want to look at how island nations like Trinidad and Tobago are responding to the threat of global warming. To help us do that, we have Roger Pawati. He's a climate impact scientist with the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA for short. He joins us from Colorado. In Port of Spain, Trinidad, we have Mark de Vertai. He's an environmental activist and founder of the Papa Bois Conservation Group. And also in Port of Spain, Trinidad, we have Kemba Jamurgi of the Fon Amon Community Reforestation Project. That's a grassroots group working to protect local forests. So, Kemba, Mark and Roger, hello Trinidadians. It's great to have you all in the stream. I'm going Thank to you. start. Hi, Hi. Hi. hello Thank everybody. You. I'm going to start with Mark. I really want to help us understand what's really happening down on the ground as far as signs that climate change is actually happening in Trinidad and Tobago. Give us real examples. Well, I'm sure Roger will have a lot of comments on this, but um, from the information that I have, temperatures have risen by about 1.5 degrees centigrade over the last 100 years or so, which I believe is about double the global average. Um, I can mostly speak from a point of view of citizen science in which, you know, I, I grew up in Trinidad. I know the climate, I know the seasons. We have a very distinct um, dry season and a, and a wet season in Trinidad. My family is actually has its origins in cocoa farming. And as farmers, you know, we're very aware of the climate. We have to look at rainfall, sun, etc. And I've, I've noticed throughout my entire life that seasons have been changing where we do not have very delineated dry seasons anymore. Okay. Rainy seasons don't seem to, you know, it could be either a drought or torrential rainfalls. I, I, I see changes. I see higher temperatures and I, I see rainfall patterns changing. Kemba, what have you noticed in your everyday life? Give me an example that just says, okay, this is how my life is changing. Hello, Kemba, can well, you hear us? I'm well, for me, for me, there's a big change in... Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. And found some on here. Go ahead, Kemba. Yes, we've been looking at the, the whole trend of, of, of the season, and everything has been changing drastically. Um, sometimes, sometimes we look at how dry the place is, and now it's rainy season. So we're expecting to see a bit more wet conditions and instead we're seeing really dry spells like if we're in the middle of the dry season and in the rainy season 
Malika? Well, we're speaking of the impacts of climate change that people have seen. We've gotten tweets from several people on that. Nasihan says rising sea levels will have a very negative impact on tourism, which can mean survival for many Caribbean Caribbeans living in the region. And a Facebook comment from Deb, who mentions massive floods every time it rains. The rain is not recoverable, Deb says, for consumption as it rushes down the mountains and floods the city. It seems like a monthly occurrence in Trinidad. Roger, are, are these things that you're noticing as well? There's certainly some changes like that happening around the region. I mean, it's wonderful to have a group like this on. Some, I think Femi was mentioning she's a geek. Well, we have a whole geek system <laughs> on the fall here right now. So within this geek system, what are we seeing? We're seeing some changes in sea level rise, yes. But the descriptions that you heard just now from Kemba, from Mark and others are documentable in the data. When we see dry conditions, the projections for the Caribbean region, including Trinidad, is very much one of a reliable signal for drier conditions happening. What do we mean by that? It means we have less water for consumption and tourism, we have less water for irrigation and agriculture, and there's something else that you just heard about flooding, that when it rains, it pours. We call it, you know, bucket a drop or several buckets at once. And so what ends up happening is that the time between heavy rainfall is increasing. That is in the data. There's no denying that. And what it means is that when it falls, you can't recapture it because you can't capture flood waters. You have to let them through the system. If you hold them and there's another heavy rainfall, you have flood events. So this is a very interesting set of changes for water resources and water resources management in the Caribbean, especially since we rely so heavily, not just on subsistence farming, not just on food imports, but on a tourism economy that requires a lot of water. I want to share with our audience a short documentary called A Sea Change. And in this documentary, Trinidadians and in three communities are actually asked about, well, what's happening in their everyday life? Have a listen to this because they're noticing some really, really big changes. We live in a coastal area and certain things were happening that we didn't understand. We were seeing coastal erosion of a, of a nature that we never experienced before because the sea is encroaching. I'm a fisherman for over 30 years and we've seen a big decline in the fish stock. Kovali, carry kingfish, you know, shark. As the fishing community, as the fishing people, we see that and I can tell you that. So that really sets the story out. What else have we got, Malika, from our community? I'd actually like to play a video comment from mm -hmm. a special member of our, member of our community. Right. Roger, I'd like you to have a listen to this and answer the question our community member asks. Hello, Stream. This is Everton Fox from Al Jazeera English Weather Department. Now, as you know, I spend a fair amount of time forecasting tropical storms. And what I'd like to know is, is there any evidence that these storms are actually getting bigger and stronger? Roger? I sit on something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and we develop very, very thick reports that keeps your house from moving away in a landslide. And so what they're telling us in those is that while we understand that the frequency of storms aren't changing around the world, only the Atlantic Basin by itself shows a trend in frequency, that in fact when storms are occurring, we are in, in fact seeing slightly stronger storms, which we, we, we would expect from climate change projections. However, to say that one storm, because it was strong last year, is the result of climate change, we can't say. But the trend towards increasing strength of storms, and what do we mean by strength? Strength when we measure storms are wind speed. Not the amount of rain or anything else, just the wind speed. That's what we categorize storms for. And the trends towards increasing slightly stronger storms are in the data. I love how Roger actually answers his own questions. He poses a question, then he answers a question. He's the perfect guess. Ken, I want to bring you back into the conversation because we lost you just a little earlier on. And I'm looking at a picture here of some of the community you work you do. This is a preschool camp. This is part of your reforestation project. Why are you doing it? And, and how does it link to maybe how the climate is beginning to change for you in Trinidad and Tobago? Um, well, we believe that education is very important. Um, when we first started the work, I mean, there was this there was this thought that you know you can't change old habits, so you can't get certain people to change, or people will never um, stop doing you know negative practices. 
And then when we see we could have transformed the entire community, then we said it is possible. Um, we started hiring some people in the community who used to set fires, who used to do um, improper farming practices. And then from then on, we started working with schools um, in 1997, and we never stopped. So we started working with schools, primary, secondary, university students, research students, um, sometimes government working groups, regional groups um, that want to share and, and learn more about what we do and how we manage to be um, successful. Right. Mark, how seriously do people in Trinidad and Tobago take the threat of climate change? I think that we are still in the infancy of building awareness. I, I really don't think that many people understand climate change yet. Um, I don't think that they understand what the implications could be. So uh, I don't think climate change is a priority at this moment. Um, you know, I see a lot of destruction going on in my work with Papua conservation, illegal deforestation, um, mining, quarrying, destroying forests. And I've actually seen projects like Kemba's out on the east coast of Trinidad where a group called Nature Seekers has been reforesting the forest and at the same time illegal quarriers are quarrying that newly planted land. You know, what I'm trying to get to is that I, I think that um, the obviously education is very, very important. We need to raise that awareness. But we also need to get a lot more support from the government and I haven't seen that support from the government yet. Well, Mark, you know, you mentioned that it's not a priority at this moment, and, and you also mentioned not seeing support from the government. I want to read you a Facebook comment from Melanie. She says, I know in Barbados, Barbados has always had solar-powered water heaters since I can remember, but would that work in a country like Trinidad? Now, I mention this because she brings up something inter interesting. She says, in Trinidad, the main focus is on oil production and where there's a stigma of sorts against renewable energy. So, of course, on an island, which is, you know, an oil and gas producing island, is renewable and alternative energy sources, is, is that something that's kind of being pushed to the side? Absolutely. Um, we, we basically subsidize fossil fuels to the tunes of, of billions of Trinidad and Tobago dollars. I, I think it's, a, a pro, you could say more or less one billion US dollars goes towards fuel subsidies in Trinidad. Um, if we threw a couple million dollars at most towards sustainable energy, it would be a lot. You know, what I would really like to see, I'd, I'd love to see our government, you know, if, if they decide that they must subsidize fuel, which I'm completely against, you know, fossil fuels, but I would love to see a system under which we could maybe get a parity subsidy for renewables. Every dollar that's spent on fuel subsidies, spend one dollar on renewable. So, Roger, this is what I'm hearing right now. I'm hearing that there are obviously issues in Trinidad and Tobago. They're linked, associated with climate change. I'm not hearing that there's an emergency or any urgency about addressing them. How do you deal with that? That's your job. Well, a big part of this is, as uh, both of the last uh, speakers have mentioned, is that there's not this awareness that, in fact, responding to the issue of climate change helps you in all these other sectors. So when you go to someone and they say in the ministry or somewhere, look, uh, I have to deal with health, I have to deal with um, with crime, uh, I can't take on this climate change stuff. And if you notice, um, certainly in the working report for sustainable development for, t for Trinidad, uh, the climate change issue is front and center in the environment. Now when we think of it as simply as an environmental issue, we know throughout the world how many societies background the environment at their peril. We are no different. So and how so do you give them, how do so you light the fire under the, how, how do you so light the fire underneath them? They can, like the data is like sitting on their heads, okay? Yeah. Um, people, locals are talking about how things are changing. Right. And then what? That's okay, so, just so weird. Let's, let's, let's continue that train of thought. Yeah. You have the CARICOM uh, regional climate change strategy. You've got the climate change center in Belize, the Caribbean coming, very successful center, by the way, that is trying to work with countries on how they respond to climate events. But let's ask this question. When people do not do something, is it because they don't have enough information or it's because they don't see the pressure to do it? So where are the incentives to make people act? Where's the knowledge basis and awareness of the kinds of things that Kimber is trying to do. We don't see it as a large effort 
within Trinidad and within, I teach a course at the University of the West Indies in Barbados on exactly this issue. How right. do you get people to be engaged in their communities such that they see themselves able to make changes? Sure. So there's an awareness. We have some interesting rules out there in Trinidad. There should be no building, you know, uh, above 100 meters on, on the Northern Range, yet that's not what you see in practice. So there are enforcement issues, there is awareness, but there's also the incentives to act that we're actually missing in a coordinated way. Roger, it's interesting because just as you were speaking, we got some tweets kind of corroborating what you were saying about people not thinking that this is a priority. Jonathan Gold tweets in, our island is a blessed one, and this is just scaremongering, but I've seen evidence of the sea right. reclaiming land, but we're good. Uh, and a Facebook right. comment from Bongo who says, why can't we try to bring awareness to our real problems? Outdated drainage systems, inefficient right. infrastructure, we have serious issues going on before we can peg our flood problems solely to climate change. So I, I want to bring in Kemba now, actually, on the back of that, because Kemba, you're actually going out there and meeting with people and raising awareness. Do you run into these type of comments, and, and, and what do you do about it? Well, that's a very common um, comment um, that the last person just tweeted, um, because very often we tend to blame everything on clogged drains, and um, the problem is, is way bigger than that, because what happened upstream affects what happened downstream. So it's all about mitigation. It's about slowing that runoff. And with climate change, we're seeing a lot of um, heavy rainfall, short rainfall, short um, rainfalls, but the, the intensity of the showers. And then after that, we ended up with flash flooding. But if we continuously have our hills burnt, um, we have you know no no draining so no drainage uphill in terms of things like contour drains and um, things like check down to slow down the flow of water from the hillsides then we're always going to have flooding whether we have a good drain or not because the volume of things coming out from the hills. I mean, when you look at a flood, you see thick slush. That is mud from the hill. Um, you see trees, you see branches, as well as litter and other things. But it's not, uh, it's not just a drainage issue in terms of the drains are not being clear, the physical drains that you can see, but mitigating what is coming out from the hill. So it's reducing that, that runoff from the hillside. Mark, I'm just thinking that some of Trinidad and Tobago's issues are self-inflicted because you do have a, a natural gas industry, you do have a fossilised fuel industry, you do emit CO2 emissions. So there's a certain responsibility amongst the islanders themselves for making sure that their environment is protected too as well, right? Sorry, could you repeat that last bit? Sure, that was a long question for me to repeat. Okay, so yeah, natural gas, you have uh, yes. fossilised fuel, you emit CO2, you have some responsibility in looking after your own environment. Yeah, absolutely. We are the number two CO2, uh, number two per capita CO2 emitter in the world. Um, we are a wealthy country, especially by the standards of the region. You know, we're one of the few countries in the region that can actually fix its own problems once we had the political will to do so. Um, What's the government doing then? You said the government wasn't doing enough. What are they doing? What are they doing? As far as I know, there's a, a study into um, a wind farm on okay. the east coast of Trinidad, All which right. has been around for a couple of years. I'm not seeing anything, you know, any real steps towards the implementation of that. Um, I, I think that really and truly what the government is doing right now, everything is is promote, promoting the use of fossil fuels through these enormous fossil fuel subsidies. And um, yeah, that basically kills any kind of effort from NGOs, from private industries to, to implement renewable, fu uh, fu uh, renewable energy. Roger, is this a depressing conversation for you? I'm just no, thinking, what's the prognostication? All. Let's do a bit of forecasting here. Yeah, as, as if, if you know any Trinidadians, you realize we don't get depressed very often. Good. We, we, ha we have a very sunny outlook, <laughs> and we believe in the capabilities of Trinidadians to solve problems. That may be part of our problem right there. The <laughs> issue is, you know, as someone said, you know, we're safe, we're good. Um, yeah, you know, that's like saying I'm falling from a building and around the 20th, 20th story somebody says, how are you doing? Well, so far so good, you know. The issue is, as people have heard uh, in many other conversations, there's a, for decades, you know, growing up you would hear God is a trini because we don't get hit by hurricanes. Uh -huh. um, well, of course we get hit by floods and droughts and so on, but I think we're framing the question a little bit 
narrowing it down really too much towards the disaster issue All right. and and in fact should be asking what is the nature of how we're going to secure our food exports and imports over the long term or water resources or ecosystem services these are the security questions that any country wanting to deal with climate change has to ask so you just change the way that you think about how you produce food because perhaps you've got more flooding, more drought, etc. Am I summarizing correctly? We're close. We used to be a net exporter of food until about 19, the mid-1970s. And now we're, of course, a net importer of food in Trinidad. Um, and we work around the world, the U.S. government does, through NOAA and others, on trying to work with folks on, well, how do you map that? How do you know where your sources are coming from? Right. So let's think about this issue that's, that's being raised about drainage. The folks have a, a, a point when they say, well, you know, we have immediate pressing problems. Sure. When we frame the climate change question as only environmental, we miss that doing those day-to-day -day types of activities are, in fact, the kind of things that get us at reducing the risk of climate change. Right. When you're on the edge, it doesn't take a big change to push you over. We're not saying climate change causes everything, but when you're managing on the edge, when smaller rainfall events are creating larger floods Roger, because you know, of land Do you know what you just did? Do you know, like yeah. 25 minutes into our conversation, you just reframed our perspective, which means that we have got a lot of material to talk about in the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. So hold that thought as we just think in a more broader sense of what islands like Trinidad and Tobago can do as the climate is changing. Meanwhile, Malika, checking in with the online community. Well, you asked a question, our community answered. You said, does Trinidad hold any responsibility? Uh, per Deep on Twitter says, the native impact on climate change in Trinidad and Tobago is negligible compared to the main polluting nations. We need to take the case international. So let's take it international in the post show, oh, shall we? so much to do in the post show. Meanwhile, here's Malika with some other stories that we're following on the stream. In the spirit of Yom Kippur, one of Judaism's holiest days, one U.S. group is helping you atone for your sins electronically. eScapegoat is an app that allows you to post your sin on a virtual goat, a loose reference to a tradition in the Torah. Once you hit submit, the goat is sent into the wilderness. More than 7,000 people have submitted their sins, like this one on my screen here. And the app's creators are posting the best confessions on Twitter at sinfulgoat. And speaking of atoning, web users are calling on the owners of a bar in China to consider doing just that. As the blog Kotaku reports, the bar in Shenzhen City hosted a video game costume party on the anniversary of the 9-11 attack on the U.S. Replicating the game Counter-Strike, some attendees dressed as American soldiers, while others dressed as so-called terrorists. The bar's management told Kotaku they picked that date to draw in more people. It seemed like the right theme for this party. It was fun but some online were not impressed. Joe tweets, a 9-11 party, that is so disrespectful. And finally, we head to Sweden where activists are preparing for mass rallies Saturday against what they call Afrophobia. The planned protest follows a Sunday night attack of a man and his child in Malmo and what police say was a race-based hate crime. Our thanks to stream community member Adam, who alerted us to the news and writes, we're fed up with this hatred, racism, and violence, enough. Will you be at the protests? We'll be following this story. So send us your pictures and your updates using hashtag AJStream. Femi? You know, we always ask our online community to take part in the program, mm -hmm. be part of the show, send us ideas. Adam just proved right there that, that it if works. You, yes. And they do it themselves on TV. Yeah, as well. Um, if I owed you $1 billion and I said, look, I can't pay it back, what would you say? Um, I might hunt you down. Okay. <laughs> See, this is a normal reaction. The reason I'm asking Malika about that is because on our next show, Brazil has decided to write off almost a one billion dollars in debt owed by about a dozen African countries. It sounds incredibly generous, but it's actually made a lot of Brazilians furious. We'll tell you why on Monday. But stay with us. The post show is next at stream.alzero.com. We will see you online. Thanks for watching.
Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about how Trinidad and Tobago is dealing with climate change. Let's get right back to the conversation. Earlier in the main show of the stream, mm -hmm. we left you with two cliffhangers. They we were, <laughs> yes, international mm -hmm. and also, well, just look, the way you should look at this is just reframe the conversation. Don't be narrow, be broad. Right. So, Roger, we'll get to that in a moment. But first, the international the angle. International, you know, and just as we went into the post show, we got this tweet from Shetty who says, I agree that small island states are the most affected yet they have the least resources to mitigate effects of climate change so another person has an idea Abud says I'm from Zanzibar and I think it's about time the UN officially established a security council for climate change for the islands Roger is that the way forward well certainly at the U UN level there's you know that a set of activities that are there partnerships with the World Bank and the pilot program for climate resilience but I really think that getting back to Mark and Kimba one of the most important things is whether or not those kinds of approaches actually get to public awareness and to ensuring that people see their own capabilities to, to reduce and mitigate local changes. And I think targeted that way at the smaller community level, the, uh, an approach like that would be effective. Mark, Barring that, go ahead, Roger, then go ahead. we're dealing with too large a scale. Right. Mark, um, you talked about awareness and, and raising awareness. Can you give us an example of how you actually do that? Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I'm a columnist with the Guardian newspaper. Um, I have an environmental column, which I just started about a month ago now. Um, I would use that column to raise awareness on climate change. I have a Facebook page, which is called Papa War Conservation, with about 8,000 people on it. And I, I would say that most days of the week, we would have something about climate change being posted on that. I mean, actually, coming before coming onto this show, I posted up a couple of pictures and asked some questions of people, you know, what they thought of climate change, like um, stuff that is every day. You know, yesterday, for instance, we had some flash flooding in Trinidad, um, a rain event that lasted for about 15 or 20 minutes, from what I understand. And in that 15 or 20 minutes, there was substantial flooding around, which could be explained by, you know, heavier rainfall in a shorter period of time. The ground can't soak it up, so you get flooding. But then, of course, everybody responded with the same arguments that we heard from some people just now as well. Um, that it's not just climate change, that it's also the deforestation, it's it's drainage that right. needs maintenance. Um, people just generally being nasty and throwing garbage into rivers. Um, so, you know, it's we what we have basically is a forum in which people can interact with us and everybody else on environmental matters. See, Mark, I'm looking at your Facebook page here, the Papa Bois Conservation page. You've got eight, over 8,000 Facebook followers here. I'm just looking for a little climate change posting. Minister Ganga Singh, yesterday's floods were a good example of climate change taking place. So this is sort of a little bit of rabble rousing. How effective do you think it is? I think it's quite effective, actually. We have some of the ministers uh, on Facebook or on our page. Um, it's, it's been a really, really effective way to reach out to the media, to reach out to the public. We would actually have environmental news on our Facebook page quicker than people, local news that is, quicker wow. than people would have from the papers or the radio. Quite often, the environmental story originates from us. Okay. Um, yeah. Good Malika. Well, you mentioned your Facebook page. Femi pulled it up, and I, I, I want to bring up one posting in particular, Mark. Um, this one, uh, Icacos, Trinidad, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Coastal erosion has swallowed the road, and we're looking at a picture um, of, of literally a road, a tire, and the water washing up onto the cracked um, pavement. Now, someone tweeted in about that area. Zinzi says, our policymakers seem to be in denial regarding climate change. Meanwhile, the Icacos area in Trinidad slowly slips into the sea. No, actually, Kimba, if you could pick up on that, because I know that you're on the ground working with people. Do you agree with this tweet about the policymakers turning a blind eye to it? Well, most of the time things are done through um, political motivation based on whether or not there's an election coming up or it's to suit their own agenda, not really to, okay, yes, we need to do this because we need to. Most of the time we need to do this because this will look good on, on, you know, on our campaign. So I think we need to just rethink how we work and how we look at development issues and how we address um, climate change. Um, cl because it's such a sensitive issue, it can't be treated as a one-off. And this is what a lot of policymakers or a lot of um, 
persons who want to launch projects. I mean, we have been doing this work here since 1982. You don't expect to stop a trend over two years, over five years. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. And um, it can't just be a one-off project, a one-off seminar, a one-off consultation meeting with, with you know, hundreds of people in one small room because nothing would really be um, productive. Um, you know, so we need to have a sustained effort towards climate change that would not change when the government changes, that would not change if one or two people pull out or decide, well, I'm, I'm not helping again. So, you know, it needs to be more concrete. It, it, needs, it needs a lot more thought. Roger, when you're teaching, when you're lecturing about climate change and the possibilities and what you can do in the Caribbean, where do you point to as saying, this island got it right? So there's a mix of things. We point to where some things in town and country planning are working. We point to a set of activities that are going on in the region. As someone mentioned Barbados and the solar water heating and the expansion of that. There are new experiments in places like Beckway in which the uh, new reverse osmosis plant has been put in, but using solar water. So there are more examples than there is pointing to one country. Well, uh, and I really want to make a, a point here that yeah. when we go out there and say, what we call in the scientific community that we make an attribution this is because of climate change we lose a great deal of credibility because the things that you're seeing that Kimba and others are talking about are the things that bring us to the point of risk such that if as climate changes we get impacts at what point do we go from um, looking at climate change to okay get over it this is our climate now hmm. do are you want me yet? to address that question yeah I think Roger you're probably okay, gonna do that no, better than anyone else Sure, there's no such thing as this is our climate now. Right. We are, in fact, in a period of rapid transition. We've had periods in the past when there were very ha active hurricane seasons, very low hurricane season. What we're seeing, however, are things that we cannot truly attribute to just past variability, but a changing climate. It's easy to say this is our changed climate because that says I know the future and here's how you respond to it. Yeah. A changing environment is quite a different thing. It's moving and learning is, and awareness is what needs to take place. That you look for clues and you investigate clues and then you say, okay, this is the, the risk threat and this is possibly what we can do to avert it in the future. So nice. if I'm looking at, say, the Atlantic hurricane season and Hurricane Humberto is the first one that's named sure. this season in the Atlantic in the last sort of 24, 48 hours, what is that telling us? Was that too small a piece of, of a weather event to tell us anything at all? So from the standpoint of climate, which, you know, we look at it from anything from a season to two years to the long-term climate change trend, you can't pick a single season and say, wow, 2004 was so active and therefore we're seeing climate change. Mm -hmm. That's the first mistake we make, is trying to find that silver bullet. Right. When you look at the background, you do see changes in the trends of strength of storms. And things go up and down. Some, when someone tells me, well, you know, how can you tell me what the next uh, five years might be like when you can't tell me what next year will be like, next week would be like? I tell them, hey, I live in Colorado. I can guarantee you next winter will be colder than next summer. How do I know that? <laughs> so the idea is that the background trends might be there, but we need to make sure that we're not fooled by single seasons. We have a quieting down of some things in the temperature record, but we know the oceans are where a lot of that heat is going. Really and so we need to put it in the context of what the longer term background is doing, not just season by season. Right, Roger, that's probably someone calling saying, Roger, do you know you're on Al Jazeera English right now? Um, Wait, or it could be the president. Or it could be the president, yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to play one last video comment because we've, we've just talked about this for the past 45 minutes and we have a nice video comment that wraps this up from a member of our community. Have a listen. I think the question that I would like to ask is based on the fact that not everybody believes in climate change and I just want to know, before watching this show, if you didn't believe in climate change, after watching the show, do you believe in it now? I think, of course, all of our guests here today believe in climate change, but that's for our audience. But Mark, I want to pose that one to you with a quick answer. Of course, that wasn't directed to you, but do you think that this will change minds on the ground? I think that this show has been pretty important because it's the first time that Trinidad climate change has been put on such an international podium. Um, I, I'm not convinced that 
you know, it would have convinced that many more people who, who did not believe in climate change before. I think, as Kemba said, that is something that you don't do overnight. That is a work of months, of years, maybe even decades. Well, we don't have decades the time, so we have to bring that back to, to a more sustainable couple of years. Um, but every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. Mark? Kemba, Roger, we really enjoyed your company. Thank you for sharing your perspectives on climate change in Trinidad and Tobago. So, moving on to the next show, which is on Monday. Brazil has decided to wipe out almost $1 billion in debt for a dozen African countries, and that sounds incredibly generous. The only thing is that many people in Brazil, they're really furious about that. We'll explain why on Monday. But for now, you'll know where you'll find Malika and myself. We'll be online at stream.azazira.com. Our weekend starts now. Take care.